My name is Molly Rahar Newman, and I played Emily Carr for five years at Emily Carr House. And my experience of playing Emily Carr has been a very interesting one because um, I believe what's been happening is that I channel her to learn about her characteristics, and then I use what I've learned through that method to establish an acting methodology to play the character. And I believe there's a cycle where, where there's a downtime, where, where I don't pick up anything at all. And that's from March till May? Yeah, till middle of May. And, she, and, then, May. and then, then what I call it, she starts moving again. So and she started moving again. Oh, she's definitely she's moving around. Moving there's around. No, okay. no doubt about it. And there's some specific signs that, she's, that seem to happen. It's almost as if there's a little veil that comes down in your eyes, halfway only, and then lifts again. It just, the just, sign. Yeah, and then so it, and then it, it it's sort of subtle, and so you maybe it happens twice, you know, and this down and up, but only halfway. A visual thing. A visual thing, yeah, and and then usually the second time I, I notice I go oh oh I think that was one I think that was hmm, maybe it was maybe it was then I wait for the, and and generally what happens is there's another one and I'm I'm wait you know I'm. I'm being attentive to it. I'm listening for it is the best way I can say it. And then once once I notice that and then I, I basically what I do is I audibly acknowledge the fact that I've got it. That I, I, I say, okay, okay, now what? Yeah, tell me what you Yeah, I say now what? Okay, okay. I got it, I got it, I'm here, I'm here. What what? Are these the same signs I should listen to to speak to speak with her? Do you think you should be interested in that, or do you think it's through channeling only? You can carry out a dialogue. Yeah? I, I believe you can, yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's sometimes tough to discern the answering back, but um, I think that's basically what happens when I'm dealing with her, whenever it is, because there's often a back and forth thing. I found, um, I did some written dialogue where, um, where Emily had a character role and I actually wrote it out and, and I was in that character role. So that was, that's an interesting way to, to do it. I don't know what exactly will prompt you when you're in that situation. But I think it's, I think it's important to be just centered and still. And, um, and one of the things I, I, that's tough to do is to not filter it. Right, not to filter it's the, what's really coming. It's really tough to... not to filter it because you automatically you want to ascribe something to it, or and and what I try to do is back off from it and just sort of take the thought or whatever it comes through at its simplest, and not try to impose any assumption. I'm trying to think of an example. Um, uh, well, when I was looking for the tree. Yeah, you had that. There was a prompting to to be looking. And then sort of a, you know, get to the fork in the road and you sort of go, uh, and you sort of just sort of feel a little pull that way. Oh, okay. That's prompting. That's subtle. It means you have to be centered and still in order to hear that. So often when, you know, if, if, if several things, times things happened in, in a car, but I had no music on. I didn't have anything interfering with just the sound just this, the, the white noise that we experience in a car. Yeah, yeah. And so I think there's a centering that that does. Oh, really? So? Uh, so I, I'm just sort of trying to just relate, you know, rushing water or, or running water um, can do that too. Um, I know I've been really hung up on birds and running water since I got into this. So who knows? Wow, maybe that's what it has to be. Well, I guess the reason I bring up these doubts is because when I read her journals, mm -hmm. when I read about, uh, when she thought of maybe some younger artists mm -hmm. trying to contact her, she it always, wasn't always in a favorable light. You know, like, with, with, with Jack Chabolt and stuff. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, I well, don't know if she didn't suffer fools gladly. I mean, yeah. I think that's a really accurate phrase to say of Emily. And she thought she thought Chabolt was a little full of himself, and she didn't appreciate that. That got in her way, in the way of her looking beyond into his art. I think. Right. Because she saw things emotionally often, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, um, she was very much her own woman, and uh, was really tired of mincing around with all the Victorian pruderies and uh, and uh, traditional stuff that went on around that time. She was had, had it. 
she had, and, and she didn't benefit from playing the game anyway. Yeah, that's right. Benefited yeah. absolutely zero. So why wouldn't you be your own person? <laughs> yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, th I think the, the the spirit. It's a strong spirit. It's just um, and it appears to be a spirit that's still concerned with the role of artists in the world, and still appears to be concerned with the value that's placed on creativity, which is. Not very much. No, it is declining you know? in some places. And yet, uh, and yet, where would we be without the creative people in the world? We would have no music, we would have no art, we would have no dance, we would have no theater. So then wh what would be interesting to do? Yeah, you can, you know, I mean, that's vital life forces of, of, of our civilization. And each person that delivers those services is not esteemed as much as, what, a CEO that's... Right. Jipping his workers here and yeah. giving himself a raise up here. Wow, yeah, exactly. talk about an unbalanced world. But things are not, not much different for artists today than they were for Emily, in a sense, where we're still all really scrambling to make a living. Um, there's not uh, not the honor ascribed to the arts, um, the arts traditions as as there is, you know, business traditions, for example, business is taking over everything. Everybody thinks cash line, bottom line mentality. Where is culture in that? Where is culture in that? Exactly. You know, where is that? And that's what she's concerned about. And she's concerned about Canadian culture. That's what I'm getting through all this. Yeah. I, I, what I'm getting is she's concerned about the survival of our culture in Canada and all the people that are vital to the survival of our civilized culture. All the arts and, and, and all those humanities. I mean, you have to struggle to keep doing it. If you're an artist, you have to work at it. You have to you have to endure a lot of adversities. And uh, I, I guess she I mean, she's concerned about the role of artists continuing. The theme I keep getting is that we have to be creative in spite of the world plotting against us spending creative time. You know, someone says, "Oh, you're painting a painting job. You weren't doing anything all afternoon, were you?" Yeah, that's you know. I mean, how common is that? You know, yeah, all the time, and yeah. um, uh, so we have to keep creating, no matter how difficult it is. It's very important that we all know how important that is, because that's what separates us from the computers and I guess is our creativity. And that's what seems to be her main thing. And to keep to keep educating yourself, keep learning and introducing new things, and not being afraid to bring the new into the old and make a new soup. But it'd be interesting to see what you get because you'll get, get something. I, I do. I do feel. You know, you just it's being centered and blanking your mind. Blanking your mind. Yeah. yeah. And seeing what comes in. And then if you do that, what happens to me is it's like a straw. I call it the straw in my brain. It's a hollow straw, and it seems to fill up. And then it gets full, and it blurbles out, and all that blurble is automatic writing or these understandings and then and it stops for a while and then it holds up again then out it comes. So the automatic writing seems to be like that. And um, so if you if you clear your mind when you're in the space where you're doing this experiment, clear your mind and then have a pencil and paper ready, I would say. Oh. Because that was a great way to do it and make it pencil, not a pen. Pencil, yeah. So yeah, specific instructions. Oh yeah. Pencil. It has to be a pencil. Oh. <laughs> and uh, you know, a sharpened <laughs> pencil. And I used a big graphite stick so I wouldn't have to sharpen it. <laughs> and um, uh, and gray paper. Gray paper. Yeah, so I don't know. So, so if I get gray paper, oh I will. I always have gray paper <laughs> and a pencil. And then what happens is your mind is just blank. And then something will come in, it might not seem to mean much. Just write it down. Then forget it, let it pass, and then wait for something else to come in. Write it down. And it's sort of like this, come in on your little screen, out again. Because then you don't attach to it. Yeah. Then you read it later and you'll understand it more. Strange, yeah. I, I can find that. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's a great way to, to get that process happening. Yeah. 